Today is going to be interesting, as um, as you'll just see in a minute. We're going to look at what mycotoxins do to us. Lecture one is available already on the mymicrolab.com website and as well as in YouTube. Just waiting here just a little more. Here we go. Let's go look first, as, as I told you, there's a four part series. Um, next Wednesday is testing, interpretation of test. I'm gonna give you a little test, a little bit of a flavor today, but basically it's testing uh, and interpretation will be um, uh, uh, next Wednesday night. And the last one will be the following Wednesday. Um, so having said that, um, let us get going now and start. So this is uh, about mycotoxins and the diseases they cause. So we know that this causes um, um, mycoses. That's what molds do. They're also called a lot by the medical media as fungi. Uh, so in, if you read in medical journals, they'll say fungi a lot, as well as mold. It's interchangeable. It's like saying a car or an automobile. Diseases caused by the toxins of mold are called mycotoxicosis. Those that, that by the, this is mycotoxicosis is what the name is, but people call it, call it toxic this syndrome and that. But this is the actual medical terminology. Molds are part of microbiology. Mycotoxins are part of toxicology, and I'll show you a little later on why that makes a difference. So, um, here's two important points after um, we come to this. Mycotoxicosis is like mercury poisoning or pesticide poisoning. These are toxins. Mycotoxins are toxins. So it's different. It's not an infection, okay? And the one good, the only good thing about molds or mycotoxins is that you can't, it's, it's not a transmissible disease. You can't pass it on from one person to the next. So here, two important points, one, a mold that produces mycotoxins usually produces a bunch of mycotoxins. It's not this mold produces this mycotoxin, no. And also, if a mold known to produce mycotoxins is present in a home or a building, then those mycotoxins are present as well and usually in much greater numbers. So it is not one mold makes one mycotoxin. It's one mold makes many different ones, many different mycotoxins. This is size matters. What do I mean by that? Hair is 100 microns thick. Spores are one to 20 microns, but really they're two to three microns. Mycotoxins are 0 0.1 microns, like a virus. So exposure to mycotoxins is by inhalation and dermal absorption. In other words, right through the skin. Ingestion, that's minimal. And I'll, we'll, we'll look at that too. So of the mold particulates, that is the, the, the greatest concern for health, is, these, is the mycotoxins, okay? They're shed by these mold colonies. The mold colony can be the size of a um, golf ball or less. And what we've seen in publications is that when you do indoor air and indoor air dust, these mycotoxins are a thousand times or greater than the indoor air mold spore count. So when you have somebody come in and say, I want you to test this 
indoor environment for molds and they count the mold spores, you can be sure that the mycotoxins are at least a thousand times higher. And what do these mycotoxins cause? Inflammation. And from inflammation, you get this circle of diseases, autoimmunity, diabetes, Alzheimer, et cetera. And we're gonna look at all of these. So, um, so this, this, these are the medical and scientific facts. And the reason I put this in is so you can see this was known and published in 1983. That's a long time ago, okay? And it tells you that trichothecene mycotoxins, which by the way, is tested for in human serum, and we have that test available. The numerous target organ systems of the brain, the immune system, heart, lung, intestine, liver, kidney, and skin. So there you go. Um, uh, next is, let's look at, let me go back here. Yeah, let's go here to black mold. This is one of the most potent mycotoxins. It's called satrotoxin. It's a trichotoxin. There's several of these, but believe me, there's red, there's green, there's gray, there's black. They're all toxic. Okay, and this one in particular affects the brain. So it causes inflammation of the brain. And one of the things it can do is kill the neurons in of your smell, of your olfactory um, system. In other words, it's the first, the, the first cranial nerve is the olfactory nerve. And this is, kills those cells. It gives you neurocognitive symptoms and inflammation with oxidative stress leading to damage uh, in brain cells. So, and nerve cells. Barucarin, barucarol, this is another one. This, this is, uh, causes immune toxicity. Um, it causes cytotoxicity, meaning it's toxic to cells and causes inflammation, tremors, and it's a very potent protein synthesis inhibitor. What does that mean? That means your body can't absorb the protein from your food. So if you eat a dozen scrambled eggs, you're not getting any protein. If you eat a huge steak, uh, you're not going to be able to process that protein. That's what this signifies. Oquatoxin. This is, causes suppression of your immune system. It's toxic to the liver. Um, it, it can change your DNA, and so it becomes carcinogenic. It's toxic to your kidneys. It potentiates interleukin-8 secretion from anywhere from 38, 35 to 138% increase. In other words, a lot more inflammation. And it makes your gut so leaky that your gut leaks out bacteria by up to a 1,522-fold increase. So this is where you get irritable bowel syndrome, leaky gut. This is where you get inflammatory bowel disorders. This is where you get SIBO and all those things. And the treatment is not to treat the SIBO, the IBS, et cetera, is to get rid of the mycotoxins. Now, here's an interesting factor because I get patients who send me their test results from other labs. Um, Oquatoxin is hooked by albumin. Albumin is the number one protein of the body. 99.8% of ochratoxin is hooked into albumin and the body does not excrete protein. It's reabsorbed, ochratoxin is reabsorbed from practically any part 
of the nephron and the kidney by both active transport and passive diffusion. And due to strong, the strong binding of orcotoxin, its elimination in urine is negligible. But I see all the time these urine test results was full of urine with, micro, with this mycotoxin, ochrotoxin. But here's the reason why. The urine doesn't test mycotoxins. It tests the metabolites of mycotoxins. Let me tell you what that means. If, you, if someone tomorrow at lunch eats asparagus, for the rest of that day, their urine is going to smell like asparagus. We've all experienced that. That's because of the asparagus metabolites. Well, it's the same thing with the metabolites of mycotoxins. It doesn't mean they're hurting you or harming you. These are metabolites your body is excreting because urine is an excretion. Okay, T2 toxin. Um, this has been weaponized, meaning armies throughout the world have used it as a weapon they made into bombs and then that, that gas emitted by the bombs make people give soldiers diarrhea, vomiting, intestinal problems so that they, they can't fight anymore. And it causes infertility in women, changes in reproductive cycle and infertility in men as well. Why? It decreases testosterone. So, <clears throat> Vomitoxin, also known as deoxynivalenol. If you get on the internet, it's going to tell you it comes from plants, um, from crops, uh, you know, corn, uh, wheat, soy, and all that. Yeah, it does come from those things. However, um, if this Deoxynivalenol is from environmental exposure, meaning your environment, where you live, where you work, okay? This one also destroys the intestinal barrier function, causing leaky gut. It causes inflammatory bowel disease. It can even lead to celiac disease. And here it is, another one that increases IL-8 secretion and affects estrogen and testosterone. Alternariol, which is the toxin from the mold or fungus alternaria. It's toxic to cells. It, it causes gene mutations, meaning it's mutagenic. It causes DNA damage that leads to cancer. That's genotoxic. It suppresses the immune system. It forms reactive oxygen species, which cause a lot of inflammation, and it lowers testosterone. I've seen young men age 35 being treated for de testosterone deficiency with either the gel or the shots and the whatnots, and it doesn't work because you're not taking care of the, of the cause. Remember, there's three parts to treating diseases. First, identify the cause. Second, remove the cause. Third, repair the damage. Don't treat the symptoms. Gliotoxin. It's mainly from aspergillus, but other molds as well. It suppresses the immune system and it's very toxic to the brain. And it's been studied uh, by various universities, medical centers, and found and linked to multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease as well. So it really affects the brain. So in the Journal of Neurological Sciences, they showed both in vivo and in vitro, meaning in real life, in, in patients, as well as in the lab, that mycotoxin, gliotoxin, causes demyelination, loss of myelin from your nerves, leading to multiple sclerosis. In a study published in a textbook, as a chapter in a textbook about the neurological and immunological effects of molds and mycotoxins, um, 
several uh, authors, and I was the principal author, we showed that these cause um, antibodies to neural tissues leading to what is known as CIDP, that's better known as chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy. And there's treatment for all this. I've seen many patients, young people, and the latest one was just recently, a 28 year old was diagnosed at age 23 as having um, multiple sclerosis by three different neurologists. He came to see me a, a year ago and his problem was that he was very tired, worn out easily. He would walk maybe half a block and have to stop and lean against the wall to catch his breath and just to kind of rest because he was so weakened. He was starting to have issues with control of the bladder and bowel, et cetera. Um, we tested him. He was very positive for mycotoxins. We treated his mycotoxins. He's completely well, has a job, and he plays volleyball now. Rutgers Medical School, 11 years ago, they stated in a study, we propose here that fungal toxins, meaning mycotoxins, are the underlying cause of multiple sclerosis. So you can't get much stronger than that. Stachybotrys toxin, remember we talked about trichothecene in the beginning in that study from Dr. Jarvis and others from 1983. So in this study, which I participated in, but the lead author was uh, Dr. Brazel, demonstrated that antibodies to trichothecene mycotoxins in the serum from stachybotrys can be measured in the serum. And this is from mold infested indoor environments. So what does it do? It causes increased capillary fragility, meaning your capillaries, those tiny little blood vessels become very fragile and therefore they hemorrhage into tissue. And the other things that it can cause is tremors, headaches, seizures, sleep disturbance, incoordination, depression. Here's with the demyelination that I talked about that leads to CIDP, chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy, can lead to diarrhea, toxicity of the liver and intestinal permeability, which means leaky gut, rash, photosensitivity, light bothers you, burning sensation of the skin and lowers testosterone and increases estrogen in men, neither which is desirable. Um, neurological effects of mycotoxins. Um, decrease the symptoms are that they have a decrease in short and long-term memory, both in, in, in children and adults. In other words, you walk around with the uh, sticky notes because you don't remember anything. There's this um, autistic, uh, autism spectrum disorder. So in autistic children, studies done at Tufts University School of Medicine in Boston have shown a direct link between serum blood levels of mycotoxins and autism. We've talked about the chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy. There's loss of balance, facial pain. ALS, let's mention this one a little more. Amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, Lou Gehrig's disease. A recent publication showed that five to 10% of ALS is due to genetic factors. And this study and, and a couple more, all in the last two years, say the rest, the other 90% are due to mycotoxins. Alzheimer's disease, let's talk about that one. There's a study that showed that at autopsy of patients with Alzheimer's, who died, their brain, 28% had mycotoxins in the brain. 
causes movement disorders and also remember Parkinson's, that's another one, and decreased visual acuity. These people have real trouble with their vision. That's because it causes optic neuritis, inflammation of the optic nerve and demyelination of the optic nerve. So here's the ALS, okay? Um, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, Lou Gehrig's disease. And one of the hallmarks, one of the big points of ALS is that brain cells secrete excessive amounts of glutamate. And the mycotoxins, brucarin and brucolol, increase the release of glutamate from brain cells by 1300%, okay? So this is why these journals of uh, these publications in, in peer-reviewed medical journals say that this is evidence that mycotoxins cause the development of Lou Gehrig's disease, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Uh, it's the most common form of motor neuron disease, okay? And here's where they said 90, percent are sporadic, five to 10 are due to genetic issues. And they say direct link between mycotoxins and that 90% of, um, of sporadic ALS. All right, A ASD, autism spectrus, spectrum disorder and mycotoxins. This is the one that I mentioned to you is from Tufts University, 172 children with autism spectrum disorder with 61 controls. So this is a com they looked at 172 children with autism and 61 who did not. And they compared the two. What was the difference? Elevated serum antibodies to mycotoxins in the autistic group. So they, this implicates mycotoxins as causing um, autism. I can tell you personally that I've treated many, many autistic children. And some, as many of you know, there's, a, as it's a spectrum. In other words, there's some who have it stronger than others and others who have it at a lighter than others but they're still autistic. The one I have autistic kids now who are going, who are fine, they're going to regular school. The ones who are very severe are much, much improved, much, much improved. So here's one, here's a case that I'm gonna give you. This is an eight year old boy. Parents went to numerous, you know, people who have a child that's autistic, they, they're desperate to help their, their child. They love that child. They're very, very desperate. It tugs on their hearts every day from the moment they wake up to when they go to bed. They went to pediatricians, pediatric neurologists, naturopaths, all this. They, they used all kinds of prescription medications, like the ones that are written here that are commonly used, as well as all the um, uh, uh, things that people are using these days to pull mycotoxins out of the gut, which is a hoax. All these binders, there isn't a single study in humans that shows that binders do anything to mycotoxins. There's studies in animals, chickens, turkey poults, piglets, sheep, uh, et cetera that under very specific laboratory conditions, in other words, these animals are in the lab and they have them really monitored carefully for what they eat, et cetera. That, that, that's the, a few of those studies have shown that these binders help those animals. Not a single one, in, none of the binders have a human study. Okay. So here's a kid, he, he, eight years old, poor sleep pattern, sleeps two, three hours at a time, occasionally aggressive with biting, scratching people, 
a lot of repetitive movements, very poor verbal skills, makes noises. He then then verbalize. He sometimes talks to himself or to imaginary people. Plays alone, has no sense of danger, and avoids any kind of physical contact. Well, this is his serum um, mycotoxin antibody levels. So you can see on the left side that IgG is really high in several of these. There's 12 different mycotoxins that are tested for. And IgE, there's two that are very high. And what's significant about IgE? IgE affects mast cells, causes mast cell activation, and can lead to mast cell activation syndrome. The IgG indicates current exposure. Remember, these are toxins. These are not pathogens from microbiology. Treatment. The first thing was they had to make the environment mold free. The first rule of toxicology is get the patient away from the toxin or the toxin away from the patient. The diet was gluten and dairy free, organic foods, juices, and water. They had to juice the juice. In other words, they couldn't buy a, a bottle at the store of orange juice or whatever, they had to actually make it. Um, spore forming bacilli for probiotic, why? Why spore forming? Well, Dr. Simon Cutting at the U Reading University in London did studies on probiotics, the basic two, which are all well known and can be purchased all over the place. These are uh, lactobacilli and bifidobacterium. And his studies that were published, um, he showed that over 90% of these two, lactobacilli and bifidobacterium, over 90% are destroyed in the stomach by gastric acids. So he is basically dead bacteria therapy that these people, when they take that probiotic. So he looked for what probiotic does work and spore forming bacilli is what worked. And what I give my patients is Megaspore Biotic that you can purchase online. Phosphatidylserine, 500 milligrams for this kid. Don't use the choline, use the serine. Research, don't get online and use your eyeballs for just watching a talking head read the medical literature and it'll tell you the difference between choline and sarin. Sarin is what you want. I get the 500 milligrams from Clara Labs. Now I also use omegas with, and this is a combination of omegas with coenzyme Q10, contains curcumin, a good anti-inflammatory and resveratrol, a very good anti-inflammatory. This is from made by Dr. Steve Sinatra, the cardiologist. He's also a good friend. And what I like about it is in one capsule, you have four different things, all which are all in, in anti-inflammatory. And if you remember, I showed you that that circle of diseases around all surrounded, surrounding one cause, inflammation. I gave this young, Boy, itraconazole, antifungal, 50 milligrams BID with food. Why? Because by taking it with, with food, you help the absorption of it. And magnesium. Now let's talk about magnesium. I wrote an article about magnesium, published an article several years ago now. And what happens with when you take some magnesium, say in a tablet or capsule or whatever, um, it, it peaks in about two hours in the blood, and then two hours later, it's back down again. So literally, every four hours, you'd have to be taking magnesium. Well, that doesn't make sense. And there are six types of magnesium. So I found a magnesium sustained release, and this is called MagSRT, and it's 
It's made by a company in Arizona called Jigsaw Health. It's great. I take it. And I gave it to this kid twice a day, one gram. So after two months of treatment, the parents started noticing improvement. Sleep was the first one they noticed change. And then there was less repetitive movements, less aggressiveness. Uh, the child became more social, sociable, better verbal skills start accepting affection. And at six months, he was mostly well, playing with others, parents delighted. Everything was, I mean, he was so much improved that when he um, met one of the previous caretakers of his, she just broke down crying at the wonderful changes she saw in this young boy. So that's autism. Let's look at the, you see the difference between the first one. Here was the first one. You see the difference between this and this with treatment. This is strictly due to treatment and not having, not being exposed anymore. Big difference. So let's look at Alzheimer disease. As I had mentioned, um, already, there was uh, uh, about Alzheimer's. In a study by Dr. Dale Bredesen, he found back in five years ago, found out three subtypes of, of Alzheimer. One is the inflammatory, number two is the non-inflammatory, and the third is cortical. And the third one could be due to exposure to mycotoxins. So a study published a year later, 2017, looked at why Finland has the highest dementia mortality rate in the whole world. More people die in Finland from dementia than any other place, any other country. Well, the authors found housing frequently harboring molds that produced neurotoxic mycotoxins. So this is a case patient of mine, he's 70, he was 76 years old last year. Three neurologists said, yep, you have Alzheimer. We did all the, they did all the tests, you know, and said, yep, you have Alzheimer. He didn't know, he lived, uh, they, they lived in a, he and his wife lived in a two-story house. Upstairs were the bedrooms, downstairs were all the living room, dining room, kitchen, all that. And in his bedroom, he didn't know where his clothes were, he didn't know when he went back upstairs, which one was his bedroom. He'd get lost if he left the house. So they, they kept him from leaving. They locked the gates and all that. He didn't recognize friends or relatives, uh, would forget things constantly, et cetera. On the review of the medical records, the only thing I really noted was that there was mild cortical atrophy, okay? Well, at 76, it would not be unusual to have some mild cortical atrophy. But on examination, his MMSE was abnormal. That's the mini mental state exam. It's the number of questions they have to answer. And it's scored, and then you total up the numbers, and it gives you a score. He had really diminished deep tendon reflexes in the upper and lower extremities. His balance was poor, his gait was unsteady, um, his pupil were, were slow to react to light. So in other words, when you shine a light in their eyes, his pupils barely move. okay? Well, otherwise the physical was okay, it was normal. So I did an Alzheimer blood screen. What is that? That's a test offered by Cyrex Laboratories that's in seven different parts. It's called their Lynx test. And it goes, it's a very detailed analysis. And I think anyone who has a, a relative, uh, you know, has a father or grandfather, mother or grandmother that's had Alzheimer, they should have this Lynx test. And by the way, uh, you may already know this, but Alzheimer is more common in women 
than breast cancer. Take that. So tested him for Alzheimer on the blood test. It was all normal. All of it. There wasn't a single abnormality. So we did the antibodies to mycotoxins. And look how he lit up with his IgE and IgG, both sides, but the IgG being worse because that's the exposure and the right is the, uh, the IgE is the one that's the um, mast cell activation. So I treated him with nitric oxide, BID. These are lozenges that dissolve on the tongue. They have a slightly sweet taste because there's some, um, um, the, the sweetness uh, uh, is, is not significant, but it makes it more palatable. Um, the magnesium that I told you about before, I gave him melatonin, not because of sleep, because melatonin is also a neuroprotector, okay? Then I gave him his Omega from Dr. Steve Sinatra. It's called Omega Q Plus Max. I gave him the adult dose for itraconazole, and I gave him therapy, which is a high-level B complex that's also from Clear Labs. So with this regimen and avoidance of any mold and mycotoxins, I also told him 30 minutes twice a day on a stationary bicycle. They lived at a high rise with a beautiful big balcony, huge balcony. And the balcony had a seating area, had a dining area, and he could uh, look out on his, from his bike. I told him to play solitaire and do puzzles. Solitaire on the computer is easy. It's readily available. Avoid alcohol. Avoid chemical additives, such as food colorings, uh, artificial sweeteners, artificial preservatives. No triclosan, you know, that's the, the, the stuff that comes in soaps, liquid soaps. And no gluten and organic foods. After three months later, vitamin D3 and phosphatidylserine. Why did I order vitamin D3? Vitamin D3 is really much more than a vitamin. It really affects the immune system quite nicely. And there's a number of studies you can read unless you're addicted to watching um, talking heads, but you should really read. There's very interesting studies on vitamin D3 available at pubmed.gov. So after eight months, his MMSE was almost normal. His deep tendon reflexes were normal. His balance was much better. His pupils were normal. His gait, he could walk normal. He could drive. He had no more memory issues. You, got, you get rid of the cause and you get rid of the problems. You don't treat the symptoms. Here's his test afterwards. So what was it like before? You can see the difference. And then eight months later, what a difference. So here's a young gal. This is a patient of a colleague. She writes this underneath. She's the one who wrote that she looks scary and she looks like an addict or something. This was a few weeks after being treated for Lyme and before she really knew anything about molds and mycotoxins. And here she is a year later. You can see just from that smile that she's, she's taken her daughter, she has three little girls, for a day at the beach and had all the energy she needed. So here's her picture before she started treatment. And look at her after treatment. If, and if you remember from showing you the slides previously on inflammatory bowel disease, this is obviously um, showing you what that means. And this is basically three months. The minimal treatment I use is six months. This is halfway through. As she says, it's nothing compared to what it used to be. And her, those are her own words. So we know that 
mycotoxins affect testosterone. What they do is they upregulate aromatase, and that's the enzyme that's responsible in the, for the last step of estrogen biosynthesis from androgens, meaning testosterone, into estrogen. It affects that. Does it affect other hormones? You bet. Estrogen. Some mycotoxins are mycoestrogens, meaning myco, meaning from estrogen from mycotoxins. What they do is they bind to estrogen receptors and that confuses the pituitary gland to the actual stores of normal healthy estrogens. So we don't want too much estrogen. It's not, we don't need it, but we do need an adequate amount for, for proper brain function, gut function, blood sugar regulation, and obviously for your normal glandular requirements. Well, mycotoxins change that. So can it change other hormones? Yes, I'm bringing three here because otherwise we'd be here all night. Here's thyroid. They did a study and this was on a group of patients who were exposed to mycotoxins because they were living around mold and they had chronic fatigue, cognitive problems, and hypothyroid symptoms, despite the fact that they were on levothyroxine, T4 therapy, which is the standard synthroid, you know. Okay, the test showed normal function, okay? Normal TSH, normal amounts of free T4, free T3, but they continued with symptoms. Well, oxidative stress reduces the capacity of DiO2 to convert thyroxine into its biological active form of T3. So instead of giving these people T3, repair this, get rid of this, and then you don't have to give them T3 for the rest of their life to take. Now, do you see what I mean by first identify the cause, Second, remove the cause. Three, repair the damage. And you've cured the patient. You've not treated him or her. You've cured that patient. Um, look at this fellow. He, you can see his finger, his ring finger, how swollen it is. That's arthritis. And you can see his skin that's psoriasis. This is an autoimmune disease called psoriatic arthritis. Why? Because mycotoxins can trigger auto, an autoimmune disease. Cushing's, Addison's disease, rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, psoriasis, et cetera, et cetera. There's over a hundred um, uh, autoimmune disorders, Sjogren's, et cetera. So look at his finger again. You can see it pretty clearly here. And this is his chest. The red dot is his nipple, obviously. But you can see how he's been affected. He had seen, this is, he started having problems 10 years prior. He'd been to many dermatologists and many rheumatologists. They'd given him all kinds of treatments as soon as the treatments wore off, everything came back again. And he was getting tired of the side effects of medications and the thing and these two areas coming back time and time again. So we treated him for mycotoxins. Here's six months later. So you can see from here to here, six months. And he's fine. He's happy guy. He's happy camper. So you can do this as well. Here's a lady. That is psoriasis. Again, this lady, she's 63. She'd had multiple respiratory infections in the past. 
She'd been given many different antibiotics from her primary care doctor, and she lived in a home with visible mold growth. Uh, she was a smoker, one pack per day for 20 years, but then she quit 10 years ago. About a year ago, she'd noticed these lesions. She was, again, she was uh, prescribed creams, immune suppressants, et cetera. She got tired of those and their side effects. So what were the symptoms? For three years, she'd noticed fatigue, short-term memory loss, brain fog, sleep disturbance, anxiety, sores that took a long time to heal, recurrent infections, dry eyes and dry mouths, Sjogren's, uh, irritable bowel syndrome type symptoms, you know, bloating, diarrhea, and then constipation, then back to diarrhea, then back to constipation, et cetera, cough, palpitations, and multiple sensitivities to foods, smells, odors, uh, she could not walk into a, uh, a certain aisles at the grocery store or in a big store that, you know, the, that had a perfume section or so she couldn't tolerate those. So she moved out of her home after talking to me and felt slightly better for about two weeks. But her symptoms, you know, she got a little better, but it continued. And she had her new home tested and it was fine. There was no mold. She found a doctor who understood molds and mycotoxins. And so he called me and talked to me and asked me what he should do. And I do this every day with doctors from all over the planet. And I'm happy to do it for anyone. Here was her test results. You notice on the left side, the IgG antibodies, how high they were. Obviously, she's very affected, even though she moved out two months ago. Okay, so it's still affecting her. Here's what she looked like afterwards. The left picture, which is kind of blurry, in the old home. The right picture in the new home. Look at her skin on her leg. It's fine. So here's her test results after. She still has one mycotoxin she has to deal with. But look at how many she had before. She had 11 high compared to one high. And you can do this just as well. Let's talk a little bit about mast cell activation. IgE antibodies to mycotoxins stimulate mast cells. These mast cells will then release histamine, heparin, protease. That's typical. But when it's the mycotoxins, the, these antibody, my, IgE, antibodies to mycotoxins will stimulate the release of IL-6. And these cytokines will signal the immune system to start an inflammatory process. So what is IL-6, interleukin-6? It's a multifunctional cytokine that regulates the immune response. Inflammation, hemopoiesis, the acute response. And it also has an important role in the development of autoimmune diseases. It's released by mast cells when stimulated by IgE mycotoxin antibodies. So which mycotoxins can cause it? Nine out of the 12 that are tested for in blood serum. So that just gives you an idea how damaging these mycotoxins can be and how they can cause mast cell activation. So this was a study published this year, earlier this year, of 139 patients with mastocytosis. 78 females, 61 males, 71 had skin problems. That's the, that's the hallmark. GI problems, especially nausea in 48. Cardiovascular in 36, musculoskeletal 27, fatigue 24, and 24 in sexual impairment. I can also tell you that my micro lab is involved in a study with the um, Washington University in St. Louis on in 
on this uh, mastocyte uh, mastocytosis. Symptoms, flushing, itching, low blood pressure, gastrointestinal problems, irritability, headaches, concentration problems, memory loss, neuropsychiatric problems, and sexual impairment. So here's a young gal, this is a patient of mine. This is her, her uh, on the picture on the left is her thighs. And these lesions will change over time. It's not that they're always the same size, same place, et cetera. No, they shift. And here they are on her wrist, on, on her forearm, near her wrist and her wrist. Here's it on the left picture, even on her neck. And then once she's treated, nothing, and you see her wrist is clear. That's the treatment. Here's another lady that I saw. That's her back and her left leg. And if you see this little black thing, that was a stitch because she first went to a dermatologist who did a biopsy. And that's now over here in healing. But you can see how quickly she got improved from this horrible itchy rash she had. She's very young. Okay, so how do you diagnose mastocytosis? Very careful and thorough medical history. Very complete review of systems. You do IgE and IgG antibodies to serum in serum to mycotoxins. Watch also for abnormal red blood cell magnesium levels, abnormal liver function tests, and thyroid issues in these patients. So I always get, when I, as I see the patient, I get the red blood cell magnesium levels and I do a thyroid panel as well as a serum chemistry panel where it includes. Obviously, this cannot be diagnosed with any kind of a urine test. So what is the best way to test for this? These antibodies, 12 different mycotoxins, both 12 IgG and 12 IgE measurements. Antibodies, this is an ELISA test, E-L-I-S-A. It's the most precise way. And there are two other university studies going on with my micro lab because urine tests are notoriously imprecise and they, they just me measure what is excreted. They don't measure what is the body burden. And remember folks, a very important thing, if you've got very high positives, like some of these patients that you saw for mycotoxins, test do an autoimmune panel. I recommend you use a laboratory that I use, and that's Immuno, Immunosciences Laboratories in Los Angeles, Immunosciences, and they have an antibody panel. When you do an antibody panel, it's positive, then also do a mycotoxin panel, because many times autoimmunity comes from mycotoxins, as I've shown you. So it's the most advanced, accurate, and reliable test available for antibodies to mycotoxins. You want to know if your patient has mycotoxins, this is the test. So IgG means current exposure and or colonization. IgE, that's mast cell, mast cell activation syndrome, and inflammation. This test is used by university medical centers in the US and in other countries. It gives you the body burden of mycotoxins and can trigger auto, that, and these antibodies can trigger autoimmunity by binding to human tissue. So let me explain something to you about antibodies. There's four, cat in microbiology, you have four pathogens, bacteria, viruses, pathogenic fungi, or molds and parasites. Fine, pathogenic molds or fungi are like um, the ones that cause uh, athlete's foot, jock itch. Those are kind of nuisance uh, problems. And then there's uh, pulmonary aspergillosis, which we looked at in the previous lecture that's available on the My Micro Lab website as well, which was lecture number one. We develop antibodies 
after you get infected or have an exposure to one of these. So if you have any one of these IgG antibody to any one of these, it means sometimes in the past you were infected. Okay, could have been last year, could have been 10 years ago. You don't know, it's just a past infection. Now these four pathogens, they're living organisms. They have cell walls, cell membranes, and it means past exposure. Toxins are not alive. They don't have cell walls. They're a group of molecules like pesticides, like mercury. So antibodies to toxins indicate current immune reaction and or causation, not something that happened way back when. And once the toxins are gone from the body, the antibody reaction fades away, just like you saw in those tests that I showed you for those actual patients. So low levels of mycotoxins are found in many foods, cereals, beans, fruits, grape juice, beer, coffee, and they're monitored. And this was this is well known by the World Health Organization and the United Nations Food and Agricultural Organization. So this is why people have mycotoxins in the urine. So, like for instance, the amount of mycotoxins tested in many foods have been shown by a numerous amount of studies to be below what is called the TDI or the tolerable dairy intake set by the Food and Drug Administration in this country. In Europe, it's the European Food Safety Authority. And in other countries, it's UN Food and Agriculture Organization, WHO, Joint Expert Committee on Food Additives. So it's here in this country, it's very strictly administered by the FDA. So why is urine test not that helpful? Here's a thing. In July, this summer of this year, a study by Friedel showed that there's one to four mycotoxins in cow's milk, pasteurized, unpasteurized. So the milk you buy at the grocery store, at the supermarket, 91% tested had at least one mycotoxin. 30% had two to four mycotoxins. However, all of them were below, were well below the TDI. What does that mean? It's, you, you get rid of it easily by the body because it's below the tolerable daily intake, okay? And this is why urine is not being used by any university medical centers to test people. So here's what Dr. Vajdani, who is the head of the lab at Immunosciences Laboratory, says, what is the source of the mycotoxins? Oh, it's food. Is it the environment? No, nope. it's food or milk or beer or coffee. Why is the detection of mycotoxin in urine not an indication of autoimmune and neuroimmune disease? Because it's an excretion. And this is because most of the mycotoxin detected in urine originates from food. And this is why the detection of mycotoxins in urine is not an indication of body burden of mycotoxins and should not be used as a biomarker for exposure to mycotoxins in water damaged buildings. You got it? So if you have mold in the home, mold in where you work or both, this is urine is not gonna help. Lastly, I, I took this screenshot. You can see at the top here, this, uh, this is from December, but the date didn't show up, but it was from this month. Urine testing, I put in urine testing for mycotoxin. Halfway down the page, this is what is said here. It's from the CDC. Use of unvalidated urine mycotoxin tests. And it says low level of mycotoxins are found in many foods. Therefore, mycotoxins are found in the urine of healthy people. All right, so if you have any questions, please uh, email me at immunedoctor at gmail.com. 
If you want more information, go to my micro lab. And if you want to see the other webinars, and there's a bunch of them on the my micro lab website, as well as the um, others, uh, as well as YouTube, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, any questions? Please go ahead. I'm gonna unmute everybody. I don't have no clue how to do all that, but that's okay. Get on for today because it's that season of the year. <laughs> on the first one, I can't um, tell you how many emails I got the next day. <laughs> so anyway, um, let me tell you, um, Alan Air Purifier says it removes down to 0 0.1 micron levels. I, in, you know, people make claims. I would ask the Allen Air Purifier people to show you evidence of that. I get solicited constantly because I've been doing this for 30 years. I've published almost 100 papers and studies in peer reviewed medical journals, chapters in medical textbooks, et cetera, et cetera. And I get these people, the, the testing for mold people, the remediation people, the, the purifying the air, the filter people, and all these things soliciting my okay to put this as I rec that I recommended or something on their website, what, blah, blah, blah. I have never done that. And unless they can, they, and I always ask them, show me the evidence, show me the beef. Is it real or is it just you saying that because you will get more sales? So anyway, I thought I'd uh, um, uh, tell you that. And also I wanna let you know the next two conferences, the new, next two sections of this, next Wednesday and the Wednesday after that, wow, be prepared because this is what you can use in your office the next morning what do you order, what do you check for, and how do you treat it in detail with actual cases? After all, I've done this for 30 years. And I'll show you some actual publications of studies to support all this. Everything I do is evidence-based. This is why I don't believe in, there's no evidence to show that there's any, anything to do with binders. There's the HLA DR testing, genetic testing. There's a, isn't a single study, not one that shows that's real, that has anything to do with molds or anything to do with mycotoxins. Yet people order that. So, and then of course you've seen today the urine tests, et cetera. So I base everything on medical and scientific evidence, everything I say. Any other questions? Otherwise, we're going to go ahead and uh, shut it down for tonight. And I hope to see you all next Wednesday evening, same time, same place. Thank you all very much. Have a great, great holiday season with all your loved ones. Goodbye. Good